Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me and the fabulous Christopher yet again. Strap in your pants. Chris, who have we got on? <laughs> Strap in my pants? <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to be funny. It didn't really work, but keep going. Well, it made me laugh. So, uh, yeah, start, start through it, start through it. Uh, yeah, I'm all right, mate. So today we have uh, Leonora, <laughs> Leonora Natras, who is a writer of historical crime fiction and a former academic who specialised in the political writings of the Georgian period and whose previous titles include William Cobbett, The Politics of Style, and Black Drop, Blue Water, and her newest book, Scarlet Town, which is a part, part three of the Lawrence Jago series. So, uh, Leonora, welcome to History Hack. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you for having me. Have you got a chocolate bar like Chris? No, I'm feeling very <laughs> deprived now. <laughs> Chris has been munching on a... Uh, what have you been munching on, Chris, while we've been preparing for this? Uh, uh, fruit and nut. Right, and he doesn't want to share with any of us, which is incredibly rude. Well, I finished it. <laughs> well, We're also a thousand miles away. You could have sent me one. Well, there's one in my fridge, come and get it. No. No, let's do some let's do some podcasting recording. I think Chris should ask ask the first question, just because I want him to. <laughs> In case my internet goes down again. Okay, okay so uh, one of the most influential uh, events of the 18th century was the in Europe was the French Revolution. But how does it affect us in Great Britain? So um, when I was thinking about writing the the historical crime series, I, I sort of I'd, I'd been working in this period as an academic for a number of years, um, and I decided to pick 1794 as my year for the first book, which was basically the kind of um, the the kind of climax of the British response to the French Revolution, which uh, was kind of like an earthquake through Europe at the time. Basically, the 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 um, when it first happened, the British public and government generally saw it as a positive thing. Um, it, you know, the French finally coming out of their benighted uh, sort of period of, you know, a monarchical and aristocratic rule and kind of coming into the 18th century, modernising. And the, and, the, and the expectation in Britain was that um, France would end up being a kind of constitutional monarchy like Britain which we'd kind of achieved through a, a revolution 100, 150 years earlier. Um, uh, and so initially it was kind of widely welcomed. But then as time went on and as um, the sort of, uh, well, especially with the kind of imprisonment of the of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette and then the, their execution and, uh, and then the sort of massive uh, internecine warfare between the radical, you know, the revolutionary leaders at the time, which culminated in the terror of 1794, the British got extremely spooked. And they um, they were very afraid that this kind of contagion of anarchy and, and chaos, as they saw it, would spread to Britain. And so the result was that in, in Britain in the 1790s, and right through really until the end of the Napoleonic Wars, there was just increasing... Uh, a increasing crackdown of like rep repression to to prevent anything similar happening here. It's very interesting. Well, the first question that's really popped into my head. I know we're going to talk about the book uh, in more depth at the end of all of these questions, but why did you choose crime? That, that's the first thing that's just popped into my head, and I don't know why. Well, there's a kind of um, it's a rather kind of prosaic answer, really, which is that. When I started, I, I when I started writing about, about the period, I knew that I wanted to write about 1794 with all these amazing events going on. You know, the war had just started. There was the terror in France. There was a uh, kind of a negotiation of a treaty to try and keep America out of the war and all that. Um, so there was lots of really interesting stuff going on. But actually, framing it into a a novel, um, you know, and finding a plot 
was to kind of weave all that stuff in was a challenge. And really, it was um, when I first started looking at thinking about writing fiction and, and I looked at what was going on in the historical fiction kind of market, I realized that, the, that most, kind, most of the time, these kind of big political issues tend to get talked about or, or woven into historical crime novels. And my first, re- my first reaction to that was to think, oh, well, that's obviously been done. I can't do that then. I'll have to try to find something else to do. But what I didn't really realize was that, you know, the re- that the, there were a lot of, of novels in that kind of genre for a reason, which is that people really like it. And so as I got more, um, more au fait with the kind of publishing world and what was going on in commercial historical fiction, I realized that that was a really uh, popular and common way to kind of be able to discuss these big quite you know potentially possibly dry topics although I don't find them very dry but you know might people might find them dry but it's a way of kind of bringing them in people love a bit of kind of political and in, political intrigue and you know uh, uh, kind of um, you know the the government misbehaving and all that kind of thing that kind of and and you know the idea of revolution people love that so so um, that and that lends itself very much to a kind of crime thriller sort of genre and it's it's such a tumultuous time period as well that you can a lot of the things that were going on you couldn't you almost couldn't make up because it's just so so fantastic so it gives you quite a lot of scope to write in yeah well when i mean in the first book black drop it it um, largely revolves around um, the idea, uh, the the sort of rumor. Well, no one's really sure how how um, you know genuine it was, but around a possible plot to assassinate George the Third um, with a with a poison dart from a from a blowpipe, and that um, led to the sort of um, a lot of um, radical figures, working class radical figures, being had up for high treason and you know threatened with hanging and drawing and quartering. But you know the actual idea of of that as a, as a kind of poison dart and a blowpipe, I would never have dared make that up (laughs) wasn't that done like the 1960s as well during the cold war if i'm not mistaken there were were poisoned umbrellas weren't there people got poked with yeah poisoned peanuts yeah it was uh, a waterloo bridge someone was walking over it and a guy walked past and caught the target with his umbrella i said i'm awfully sorry and then within a few hours the man was dead I, i can't remember the guy's name but yeah I think we did a podcast on it a couple of years ago, and now my brain is totally fried to who it was. But yeah, yeah, well, you know, history <laughs> repeats itself. That's the interesting thing. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so coming back to your book, let's talk about the revolution debate because you have that debate between Burke and Paint. Tell us a little bit about that. So, when, as I say, when the when the revolution first happened, it was generally seen as a good thing. And that you know um, France was going to become just like us. So, so in that context, there was a Unitarian uh, church preacher called Richard Price, who public who who preached a sermon in 1689, celebrating the glorious revolution in Britain of 1688 and comparing it to the French Revolution, and saying that um, what the French were doing was what we'd done in the in the um, in a hundred years earlier when we'd kind of got rid of James II and brought in William and Mary of Orange, uh, which was basically, he said, that showed that we, um, the, the public in Britain, the people of Britain could get rid of their leaders, cashier them for misconduct, he said, um, uh, uh, you know, if they weren't happy with them, and that that's what the French are doing. Uh, now, that, that might have all seemed quite sort of, um, you know, innocuous, except that Edmund Burke was was kind of listening, and Edmund Burke was a, a great Whig statesman of the 18th century. He was a um, a great orator, and had been a great supporter of the Americans during their revolution. So it was a great surprise to everyone when Edmund Burke read, reacted to this sermon um, and wrote a book called Reflections on the Revolution in France, in which he took on both the whole idea that that these sort of revolutionary ideas were now part of the British the British constitution, but also that revolution was desirable at all. So he said that our revolution of 1688 had basically just reinforced our constitutional relationship between the monarchy, the lords, the commons and the people. And um, and that um, looking for kind of a radical and violent change from one system to another was a recipe for disaster. So his, his kind of... Um, 
whole book is about the idea that political change should be evolutionary. He says that, you know, the state, the, the British state's always changing as people die and are born. Um, you know, attitudes and, and ideas change in a very natural way that he, he likens to the sort of family. And uh, he says that's the way to achieve political change. And he predicts that the French Revolution will end in, in bloodshed and chaos and anarchy. And this is, he's writing this in 70, early 1790, I think. So this is before um, the, the sort of execution of the monarchy and before the sort of degeneration into the bloodshed of 1794. So a lot of people thought that he was kind of, you know, hysterical. But actually, it's, you know, it's very prescient. He, he actually predicts a lot of things that really happened. Anyway, in response to him, there was a whole um, sort of outpouring of, of, of printed responses from the sort of intellectuals of the time, mostly the young intellectuals. Um, so Mary Wollstonecraft wrote a response about the rights of man. And then a few months later, she also added, added another second book called The Rights of Woman, which is what we now remember her for most. Um, but, but the biggest response was from Tom Paine, who'd been involved in the American Revolution and had, I think, had helped to uh, kind of shape the whole idea of the American Constitution being based around kind of self-evident rights that, that, that men had. And, um, and he, and he came back to, to Burke and, um, in a very kind of measured and logical and, uh, you know, uh, very kind of unarguable way and, um, and argued for human rights, basically, which, and I think the, the really interesting thing about the French Revolution debate is that it was the moment, I think, when we kind of, along with the American Revolution, where we moved away from politics being about religion in Britain to politics being about rights. And really, that's the basis, of, that's the beginning of, of the world that we know now. I mean, that was the big difference between uh, the French Revolution and the American Revolution is that uh, for the majority of the American Revolution, they considered themselves still to be British or in British citizens just trying to get greater rights and a fairer electoral system. Whereas in front was more, it became more about overthrowing the shackles of oppression and getting rid of them all and so there was like this massive difference between the two yes and uh and i think it it has um a lot to do with the fact that as i said at the beginning you know france was still a, a completely monarchical and aristocratic state um there was no room for middle class you know in the middle class intelligentsia to actually have any power so when the french revolution started it was lawyers and um, you know robespierre was a lawyer they were the kind of people that were kind of pushing pushing the um the kind of revolution and then it kind of spread to be uh you know the kind of the mob got involved so to speak but um although i don't think they ever really um, even in France, even under the, the, the kind of um, revolutionary government, the, uh, the electoral system was still, you know, it wasn't it wasn't one man, one vote. Um, but whereas the American revolution, obviously, they'd they'd been a, because it was British, there'd been that kind of space for for um, uh, middle class kind of involvement, which is where, you know, the impetus for, for revolution comes from rather than the poor. So what was our electoral system like in Britain at the time? Because kind of hinted it, it, it's not. It's not fair, is it? No, it's certainly not. Um, you know, the basically ninety-five percent of the population didn't have the vote, uh, and ninety-five percent of the population were, I think, what we would probably now call disadvantaged. So that included all women. No women had the vote, obviously. And the and the the um, electoral system, the vote was based on uh, um, property property qualifications in most cases. So there were there were and it was also quite arbitrary. So there was a kind of county franchise which covered the countryside, the rural areas, and that was reasonably sensible um, in, the, in as much as it was the same everywhere. Um, so it both in and it was the same in Ireland and Scotland as well, I think. Um, and basically, it was based on your uh, rateable value. So the rateable value of your home, um, you know, was a, a decided whether you had the vote or not. So at least that was kind of rational. And it had, it had been that way for years. And the rateable value hadn't changed for years, a bit like they never change now. And um, so it actually was getting a little bit more democratic because uh, gradually, as inflation happened, more people were coming into the get becoming, um, you know, eligible to vote. 
But the towns were a complete hodgepodge of different systems that had grown up ever since the, me the medieval period. So there were um, there were some constituencies where it was to do with with um, with like you know rates and taxes. So there were uh, pot walloper um, boroughs where basically if you um, owned a, a hearth that you could boil a pot on, you had the vote. So basically, it was about owning a house. You had Scott and Lot boroughs where um, it was based on if you paid corporation tax, you know rates basically. Um, but there were and there were and there was there were other ones there, there like the the um, Burgage boroughs where it was based on if you owned a particular property you could vote and that's the source of the kind of rotten boroughs that are so famous like Old Sarum Old Sarum was a a a, a, a Burgage borough basically um, if you owned the houses in Old Sarum you had the vote the problem was nobody lived in Old Sarum anymore it had kind of decayed away and the houses were empty ruins. So in the 1820s, a couple of brothers bought up all the houses in Old Sarum and voted for themselves to be MP and got sent to Parliament. So, um, so that so that was a kind of that was based on property too. And then there were a few where it was more about um, uh, about your status, I suppose, in the town. And and Helston, the the um the town in my book Scarlet Town, my new book, is a um. Uh, a freeman a freeman corporation vote so basically the freemen of the town who get appointed by the mayor and aldermen of the town they have the vote so it's more about i think they were supposed to be polite uh, polite and discreet and upright men you know that had been appointed by the by the mayor and aldermen so that wasn't so much obviously it would still have a lot to do with with how how rich you were but it was um that was more a kind of uh, being a respectable kind of man so there were all these different um, qualifications to vote, and they'd all a lot of them, like with Old Sarum, you know, they just kind of rotted away over time. There was another famous um, borough where half of it was underwater, but it still sent two um, MPs to Parliament. So that was in Suffolk. So, and that was another very famous cause celebre at the time of a, of a ridiculous system. But my um, the system in Helston. And the reason that I wanted to write the book about in write Scarlet Town it, um, was equally ridiculous because due to a kind of feud that had been going on in the town for uh, 30 years, um, they'd ended up with one voter. So it was a town of 2,000 people and there was only one voter left and he was 80. So that just seemed like um, it seemed like it was a ridiculous idea, but it also seemed like, um, you know, uh, a perfect setting for a murder mystery. I think everybody on this podcast right now would be at a disadvantage. You and I for being women and Chris, because I was just before he jumps in, not because you're ginger, Chris, that's not the reason why. <laughs> because you wouldn't have been like high enough class to be able to afford any of these things. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, my, my family were agricultural laborers at that point. So definitely didn't own anything. Yeah, yeah, no, me, me either. No, I, I certainly wouldn't have. Would, my family wouldn't have had the vote, and that's the and that's one of the things that in in Black Drop there's a point where my main character Lawrence, who's a government clerk, but lives in lodgings in London, and his sidekick William Philpot, who's a journalist, just come back from America, so also renting. They neither of them can vote, even though uh, Philpot's like ranting in the press, you know, all the time, and he's a political journalist. He doesn't actually have the vote, and Lawrence is working government. He doesn't have the vote. So you know, it's um, it is really a tiny proportion of, of the population who actually uh, returned MPs but it didn't stop everyone else being really interested in it you know including women you know women could kind of um, uh, affect what their what the male members of their household did if they were if they had the vote you know and um, and some women who who were kind of widows or had were kind of had inherited estates they although they couldn't actually go to the hustings themselves they could you know they could influence who got voted for and the poor were always up for a riot you know they were always up for a punch up so there was always massive interest in in politics even though the actual number of people that voted was very small very similar to the time in the roman period where women could campaign for for men but they couldn't actually vote themselves so it's quite so I think you know the difference between nearly a thousand or well, more than a thousand years things still didn't change 
But also the poor didn't have the vote either. You know, we kind of we think about women now, obviously, because that's because that's one of the things that's been very important in our in our kind of, you know, recent history. But basically, you know, nobody, everybody was disadvantaged apart from a tiny elite. And I just add, if this was in Poland, then part of my family would not have been disadvantaged because my great grandmother was an aristocrat. So, but I was a woman, so oh. obviously disadvantaged. But her, yeah. her father, he was in Polish parliament and all that kind. Of, so, yeah, that they, they would have been fine, just not the women. She could obviously. have been the power behind the throne there. She oh, exactly. Been. Well, she was very beautiful, and she was very, um, she was a socialite. Um, oh. Not that that existed really in Poland in those days, but she was, uh, yeah. Anyway. Well, we're, we're aristocratic women. They did things like, you know, they had soirees where they would invite all the main political kind of, um, uh, you know, men of the day from from the House of Commons. These are like elite women. They would um, they would like make sure that particular men met each other to pursue particular ends. Um, they there was a faint, there was a story of a, two daughters of a of an MP who they basically acted as gatekeepers and they would decide whether he, whether people were allowed to see him or not. You know, if they turned up at the house. So you know, there were ways of there were ways of exerting influence. You know, people weren't just kind of. I suppose you know everyone does what they can don't they people don't just sit and uh you know uh, be obedient all the time they'll kind of and and the, and the same with the you know with the radical poor especially as as the period went on from the french revolution you know there were more and more public meetings and people trying to exert influence on what went on inside the house of commons so moving on to talking about a little bit more fun because we like to learn about people's research so you must have found something Really out of the box, crazy, funny, interesting. Something along those lines must have piqued your interest. It could be more than one. Well, really, this is. I mean, I've already, I've already covered them. Really, I mean, there's the the very famous um, things like Old Sarum, you know, which was just like a ruined village in the middle of nowhere, with where the, I think the burgage in question, the actual thing that gave the the. Um, the uh, right to vote was a field, you know, an, un- an unplowed field now. It had just been abandoned. So this field gave you the right to return two MPs to Parliament, uh, the, the, vill- the town that was half underwater, and then Helston, where, and, and Helston wasn't alone actually. There were several towns in Cornwall with one vote, only one voter left, and they were usually very old and irascible and kind of, you know, very attached to their rights. Um, and then, of course, at the other extreme, the fact that Manchester and Liverpool and Leeds didn't have any MPs at all. So they were just uh, because they at the time when all these burgages had been established, they'd just been villages or not even anywhere at all. They'd not they'd not existed because they grew up as, as you know, around the kind of factory system of, of wool and cotton through the late 18th century. As you said earlier, the poor had no right to vote. So as what was made up in the north was predominantly working class. So yeah, and also, but but you know there was huge pressure for reform, and, and when reform did come in 1832, it was largely because there was so much wealth in the in the north by then, and you know the factory owners were the new aristocracy. Really, they had more money than the landed gentry, and the landed gentry were desperately trying to marry them to get their money, you know, for their impoverished kind of estates. So you know, um, in this period, there was it was you know it was a crazy system where really influential important men in the north were um, were couldn't couldn't you know couldn't vote so what was the helston feud because it's it's really quite a complicated thing isn't it well um yeah i don't want to i don't want to um i'll try and i'll try and keep it simple so basically um the story the reason i suppose if we start with the fact that in in scarlet town um the story revolves around the fact that there's one 80 year old voter who's actually legally got the vote and he is in the pocket that it helston was what was called a pocket borough because he was in the pocket of the duke of leeds who was the town's patron who gave money to the town in return for um them more or less voting the way he wanted them to at the at the elections um and uh so there was there were those two. There was the one party, the Duke, and this one old bloke. And then there was um, the corporation of the town, the mayor and alderman, and the freemen of the town. There were about thirty of them, and they didn't have the vote. And they and so Scarlet Town is about um, a moment, a real story of when the new corporation 
um, decided that it would declare its own freeman eligible to vote and set up and got two candidates and voted for them. And the two votes, the double return, the two votes went to Parliament for Parliament to decide who was the who was the rightful voter and, and um, you know in this town. And basically, the new corporation was saying this is a ludicrous situation. You've got to do something about this. So, but the the way that the reason that that had happened was went back about thirty years, because basically the um, Helston was a as I say it was a borough. It had had its charter from Queen Elizabeth, and it was made up of five aldermen and um, and uh, as many freemen as they wanted to elect. And the five aldermen shared the office of mayor between them. Um, uh, on an annual basis, they kind of vote one of themselves in on uh, annually to to be mayor. Um, and uh, unfortunately, or inevitably, we might say, you know, people and politics being what they are, basically, the, there were five aldermen. Two of them were in one family called the Johns. Two of them were in another family called the Rogers. And there was then a, third, a fifth bloke who was like independent and wasn't didn't belong to either of these, either of these families. And basically. They'd been kind of feuding and trying to get the majority on this among these five aldermen for for years. So, um, so it it had it had always been very um, kind of um, you know argumentative and and people storming out of meetings and all that kind of thing. But then uh, eventually the oldest um, Rogers died. So there were now two two Johns, one Rogers and one Williams on the on the. Um, uh, uh, left of the of the five aldermen, and they so because there were four of them, obviously they couldn't get a majority unless somebody split ranks. Either the one of the Johns split ranks, or or the two people that sort of were standing against the Johns did. So basically, they couldn't they couldn't come up with a, a way to elect a mayor. It was basically a stalemate. So um, they um, eventually they went to law about it. Um, the the guy who was the sort of uh, uh, um, town patron at that point, the predecessor of the Duke of Leeds, he went to law and said, "This is ridiculous. Somebody needs to set in, set, step in, and sort this out." But unfortunately, the court of the King's Bench couldn't really um, decide what to do, who who to favour, you know, whose side to come down on, because they basically both elected a, a mayor each, and there was no nothing much to be said for either of them. And then the lawyer involved in in finding all this out discovered that there were all sorts of irregularities with the appointment of freemen that have been going on for years. Um, I think probably, you know, corrupt practices. So initially he found five freemen that he thought might be a bit dodgy. And then he found another eight freemen that he thought might be a bit dodgy. So um, he presented all these to the court of the King's Bench and they said, well, we, you know, we can't possibly, um, uh, you know, um, get rid of everybody. So we'll we'll have a 20 year rule. We'll say that anyone that was appointed more than 20 years ago is will be exempt from these investigations and we'll just look at what's been you will just look for corruption in the last 20 years which basically ended up with everybody that had been elected a freeman for the previous 20 years being struck off and there were only six left who were obviously all a bit older because they'd been appointed more than 20 years ago and um and uh um and they said that you know and that, and that was that was the establishment so then there was now four aldermen who couldn't um you know agree on anything plus just six freemen and um, and then two more one by one the other the other aldermen died so first of all um, the other Rogers died. So suddenly the Johns were thrilled because they had two people to, against this one, you know, um, uh, uh, independent guy. But then within a, within a few weeks, one of, one of them died, you know, because they were all, everyone was getting on. So they, so they ended up at the point where they were like, they went down from five to four to three to two to one to, to, and eventually there was only one alderman left. And, and it was decided that he couldn't possibly just vote for himself and elect a whole new load of aldermen and freemen, you know, off his own bat because that that wouldn't be that would be ridiculous so at that point um the patron of the town lord godolphin he went off and persuaded parliament to just say this is ridiculous this is all you know we've got to call this at an end the, the whole system's broken the charter must be revoked and we'll have a new corporation so that's what they did and they elected the new corporation the new mayor the new alderman the new freeman and it all seemed like very sensible and this they, there were like six old these six old voters left who were very disgruntled but um you know um, there was nothing much they could do about it, except there was a twist, which is what creates my the premise for my story, which is that there was a rule, there was a law that had been introduced about 10 years earlier that um, 
you couldn't just sort of appoint Freeman in order to vote for the MP that you wanted. So in other words, if, if the mayor and alderman wanted a particular person to be elected as MP, you couldn't just, they couldn't just appoint loads of Freeman to vote for that person, you know, and, and guarantee the verdict. So there was a law that you had to have been a, a, a Freeman for a year before, um, before an election was called in order to, to be allowed to vote. And, um, nine months after the, um, the new corporation was created or the, all these new freemen, uh, an election was called. So that meant that none of the 32 new freemen had actually been in office long enough under this new rule to vote. So the six old men full of great, um, vim and vinegar went to parliament and said, this is, you know, illegal. They can't vote. And parliament agreed with them and basically said that until the six old men died, they should always have the vote for the, for the local MP, which is how we end up at the point in Scarlet Town where there's one of them left and, uh, and he's up against this whole properly appointed, you know, sensible corporation, but, but that is completely powerless to vote. And I won't say what happens next because that would spoil some of the book. So obviously we don't want to spoil the whole book, <laughs> which would be just completely pointless. And then people just won't go out and buy it, which is what we want people to do. We want people to go out and buy your book. Can you reveal anything from your plot that can kind of, tickle our fancy a little bit you know um I, well i can say that i i slightly twisted it um so i i made it so that um there were two left at the beginning of my novel but only for about a page a couple of pages first couple of pages there are two of these old voters left but at the end of the about the second or third page the one of them is um is found dead in the guild hall locked in a cupboard surrounded by burnt papers and a di having died of smoke inhalation. And that's kind of based on another true story because when they were down to three freemen in real life, there was a, there was a point, one of the, one general election, they, um, two of them wanted to vote one way and the other one wanted to vote the other. And, and being extremely irascible old men, he went off and set fire to all the parish papers in the guild hall as a kind of, as a kind of protest and of being outvoted. So that was kind of based on, on a bit of real history as well. Um, so anyway, so, so there's a kind of murder mystery set up at the beginning. Or at least a mystery anyway. Maybe the fact that it's murder kind of takes a little longer to, to come out. But the idea of why is this man locked in a cupboard surrounded by, why is he burning all these papers? Uh, what's going on? So that's, that's the kind of, um, setup that's set up in the first chapter. And my, my character, Lawrence Jago and his friend, William Philpot, they're, um, they're set on to, um, investigate and try and find out what's happening and in the process they have to deal with all the different parties so there's um the mayor glynn who's a bit of a kind of um uh he's a bit of a hard man really he's he's ambitious and he's he's got the chairman of the east india company to come and stand as the candidate in in the borough you know for the for his side he really wants to kind of woo the the great and good there's the duke of leeds who is extremely irascible, as bad as the as bad as the old voter really. And he um he was known in he had a he had an, an undersecretary called um Sir James Burgess, who's his MP, candidate for MP. And in real life, Sir James Burgess was known as the Duke of Leeds pincushion, because the Duke of Leeds, when he got cross, would just kind of poke him, you know, and uh, and uh, and uh, tell him off. So he was so he was, he was like a really difficult kind of character. Uh, so Lawrence has to cope with him, and then Lawrence's old old um, old love, who's appeared in Black Drop, is the woman that he's been in love with for ten years. She turns up uh, attached to the Duke of Leeds's party, which kind of affects Lawrence's loyalties a bit. So, and then and then finally, the other thing that the other um, character who appears on the scene is the sapient hog, the performing pig who um, the Duke of Leeds has, has um, booked to come and entertain the town as a kind of a part of his way of persuading, you know, everybody that um, that he's the rightful kind of town patron and that his that, that his voters vote should stand. And so there's a kind of, uh, yeah, the, the sapient hog has quite a big role to play. Uh, he was able to spell out words with alphabet cards and do sums and if you asked him where something that you'd lost was, he'd be able to tell you and uh, he'd be able to tell you what people were thinking. So he's a bit of a kind of psychic hog. Um, and he was very famous. He performed all through Europe, so all the crowned heads of Europe. And uh, 
Uh, so it was a great coup that the Duke of Leeds gets him to come and, and perform in Helston. But it gets he's even more. In, uh, it turns out that he's even more involved than we might initially think. But again, I won't spoil it. Yeah, that's that's, that's enough hook. For me, you had me a man found dead in a cupboard surrounded by burnt paper. That's like awesome. <laughs> now I sound really deranged. <laughs> no comment. But yeah, no, this sounds really, really interesting. Um, can you just remind everyone the, the title of your book and when it's, when it's due out? It's called, well, the book's called Scarlet Town and it's out on the 5th of October from all good bookshops and, of course, on Amazon and all the other online things. And it's an audio book too. Yeah, we'll we'll try and get it for um the History Hack online bookstore as well. And then that way you'll get more money with every sale. We get a tiny bit of the money and Jeff Bezos can't use it for building a Death Star or whatever he's using the money for these days. Oh, brilliant. Very good, yeah. Well, it was great having you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.